Tonight's lecture features one of my favorite people, our Director of Collections, Bernadette Rogoff. Bernadette has her Master's in Decorative Arts and has been curating Monmouth County history for the last three decades, with 43 changing exhibits under her belt at MCHA alone. She has the most incredible knowledge of everything from 18th century textiles to all mediums of artwork to the most obscure artifact in our collection, always with a cool story to go with it. So if you come across some strange object in your attic and you want to know what it is, ask Bernadette because you have a good shot at finding out. She wrote an authoritative book on early 19th century folk artist Michael Williams and is an expert at identifying his work. Tonight, she'll be discussing her in-depth research on the Freehold Young Ladies Seminary, and you are definitely in for a treat. So without further ado, please welcome Bernadette Rogoff. Thank you, Dana. Let's share screen. Go. Okay. Bottom. Maybe try the top one. I'm not sure. Yeah, we got it. We're good. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. If you can believe it, everybody, I didn't even pay Dana to say all those nice things about me, <laughs> but I'll probably have to buy her a drink. Thank Definitely. you so much, everybody, for being here this evening. Um, I am really fortunate right back at you, Dana, to be able to work with you. You just make coming into work so much fun. Um, I work with some really great people. Um, in uh, addition to Dana, there's Joe Zemla, our associate curator, um, Kristen Zielinski, volunteer in admissions, um, Kim Bedetti just joined us again, um, also in the library and archives, so I get to work with some really nice people. So without further ado, history, when you come right down to it, is all about people and their stories, and tonight I have a really, really good story to tell you. Struggle, achievement, hope, hard work, life lessons, friendship, family, all centered around a girls' school known as the Freehold Young Ladies Seminary. The period of suffrage is coming. The period of bloomers has already come, and with them is marching the new woman, with one hand on the saddle of her wheel and the other filled with voting tickets. She wishes to come that way, let her come. We are the women of the present, we will be the women of the future, and by us will be made the history of ages to come. These stirring words were spoken by 21-year-old Maud Horner in June of 1895 at the Golden Jubilee Celebration of the Freehold Young Lady Seminary. Horner's hope of women's suffrage would not come to pass for another quarter of a century, but she and the more than, more than 900 other young women who passed through the seminary's doors in its more than 50 years of existence, helped to move forward the goal of Americans, American women's right to vote. In early 1843, uh, three men, unlikely, unlikely compatriots, got together. Reverend, Reverend McLean, Judge Haight, and Mr. Hall came together with an idea to start a school, uh, a school for women focused on women's education. Uh, Reverend McLean was um, a graduate of Princeton Theological Seminary. He was one of those men with more energy than any three people. And um, he got together with uh, Judge Haight and um, Judge Hull. Uh, Judge Hull was very interesting. At the age of 14, he was actually arrested during the American Revolution and spent time in the notorious Sugar House prison held by the British. When they first got together in 1844 to found this woman's school, the first person they tapped to head it up was a man named Moses Parmalee Case of Vermont. Case lasted less than a year, really didn't work out. And I think it was probably because of his health. He had actually had to leave several other positions beforehand because of it. And he died relatively young. I always wondered if it might've been uh, consumption or tuberculosis, something like that. And then, McLean, Hull, and Haight decided on Mr. and Mrs. Amos Richardson, and that would spell the success of this institution. Richardson was born in 1812 in New Hampshire. He graduated from Dartmouth College, and in 1840, he married Ruth Freeman, and they had three children, Sarah, Laura, and Charles. And at the time that uh, Reverend McLean re reached out to Richardson, he had been a principal for at least four years at the Freiburg Academy up in Maine. And they offered him the position. They came down and scoped out Freehold and they accepted. 
we have a rare and beautiful insight into Amos. We ha happen to have his, his uh, diary from 1833 to the end of 1834. And these were really crucial years for him. It was the year before he entered Dartmouth. He was trying to find himself, figure out who he was. He was 19 when he started the diary and he uh, was 21 when he finished it. Um, he was so concerned about really making a difference in his life and in the world. Um, he went through a period where he decided maybe he should be a lawyer, maybe he should be a teacher, he wasn't quite sure. And uh, finances were tough for him, but his love of learning was incredible. Um, and even though he didn't think he was a good writer, you read the pages of this diary. And for example, spring was his favorite season. And when he wrote about birds the, the flowers blooming and so on, 188 years after he wrote these, you can hear those birds, you can smell those flowers. That's how poetic he was. Um, Eye Trouble, and this is foreshadowing, if this was a movie, I would whisper foreshadowing to you all. Eye Trouble seems to uh, have run in the family. Um, his mother had eye trouble, his sister and a cousin. Um, and right before he went to Dartmouth, he was having trouble seeing. Um, and by the time he entered school, um, he was blind in his left eye. It's also interesting because when I look at the journal and I've transcribed it, um, I can tell when his eyes were bothering him because you can tell by his writing, it changes. He did not make the Freehold Seminary a success on his own. Um, part of the partnership was his wife, Ruth. Uh, she's also just an amazing person. Um, I don't know if she ever kept a journal or not. We do have her handwritten reminiscences that she wrote for the 50th anniversary celebration in 1895. And the thing that she apparently remembered the most about Freehold when they came down was the mud. She, page after page, she talked about the mud. And one of the things she remembered was watching two girls who wanted to visit one was on one side of Main Street and the other on the other side of Main Street. And they, they literally couldn't cross the street because the mud was so deep. So they both walked along opposite ends of the street until they were opposite each other. And then while wagons passed back and forth, they shouted a visit at each other. So I guess that was the 1845 version of social distancing. Um, she also kind of came, uh, it was sort of like one-stop shopping because she and Amos came down in 1845 to start the school. And by 1848, her entire family had picked up stakes from New Hampshire and relocated to Freehold. Her brother Otis, fun historic side effect, side fact, um, he left a successful medical practice, reestablished himself in Freehold, and at his death at the age of 92 in 1902, he was the oldest practicing physician in the state of New Jersey. Ruth was also called upon to be Amos's eyes. Um, we'll get to the, uh, the new building that was built in 1855, but a freakish accident happened in 1855 on July 14th when they were looking at a new building um, for the school. Um, he and, and Ruth were, were walking around the second floor and he heard a noise and he knelt down and, and put his right ear to the floor which is probably not something you should do on an active construction site. And at the same time that that happened, a carpenter that had been working below to hang a chandelier was using an auger and the bit came up through the floor and clipped Amos in his right eye and he was blind permanently. Um, he didn't give up. He rec recuperated for less than two weeks and was right back at it and taught for 26 more years. So Ruth was his eye. She did all the correspondence. Um, students would lead him from one classroom to another, um, but it was her support that kept the school going. So here we have a, a map. I can show you where, where the property was. This is Main Street here on the, on the right. You can see that. I don't know if you can see my arrow, um, but right here is Main Street. And here in the green in the center of the map here is the Ladies Seminary. And the, the building right here on the, uh, the lower uh, right portion of the property, that's the old building that was originally built in about 1845. And then in 1855, the new building here 
uh, was built. It was a very large piece of property. And Freehold was thought to be very healthy. It was centrally located. So it was really a practical place to have it. Um, Ruth in her reminiscences described it as a little town of framed buildings with only one brick dwelling house, one brick store, and one brick church. Everybody practically knew every other person in town. Um, as the county seat for Monmouth, Freehold was centrally located. Good transportation, stagecoaches, steamboats, the train. Uh, had several newspapers, including the Monmouth Democrat and the Monmouth Inquirer. Uh, in the pages of the papers in the spring of 1845, when the Richardsons came down, Throckmorton's and Craig's Dry Goods Store were advertising everything from brandy and gin to chairs and churns. Uh, cabinet maker William Smith, who had a shop on Main Street, was informing his clients that he was prepared to make coffins at a moment's notice. And the millinery shops of Mrs. Egberton Hall and Mrs. Cook and Hire were conducting a genteel bonnet war for Easter hatware. Right away, Amos Richardson made an impression. Uh, the Monmouth Democrat said, the more we see of Mr. Richardson, the gentlemanly and polite principal, the more we are convinced that we have now in our midst what we so long needed, a seminary in which young ladies may receive as thorough an education in all the ornamental as well as the solid branches as can be received in any other institution. Pretty high praise. In 1852, an advertisement in the Monmouth Democrats said that during this whole period, no pupil has died while in connection with the seminary. That seems kind of a, a strange um, thing to brag about, but actually at this time in, in history, it was really very important. No outbreaks of diseases like cholera, scarlet fever, typhoid. This meant the school was clean, well-run and safe. Um, so the, um, the school was almost an immediate success. Um, by the third year, they had a full house of students, both boarding and day, day uh, scholars. Um, the Monmouth Democrats said that Mr. Richardson deserves much credit, and we have no doubt will reap a rich reward for his enterprise. Uh, these are some pictures of some of the buildings. The original building is here at the top right. Uh, that served as classrooms and dormitory until 1855, when the building to the top left of your screen was built. And then the, uh, the original building became just dormitories and uh, domestic space. And then all the classrooms and everything uh, moved over to the new building. And the property was quite extensive. They had a lot of, lot of property for outdoor activities and croquet games and um, other exercises and things like that. So what did they study? The first prospectus of the seminary was absolutely dazzling. I, I don't think I could pass these things. Uh, mathematics, philosophy, chemistry, geology, botany, anatomy, religious studies, history, composition and speaking, French, Latin, art studies, including drawing and painting, and manners and habits of order. That was Mrs. Richardson's bailiwick. Music was absolutely vital. Amos loved music before and after his accident. He could play the violin and the flute. He even taught singing school from time to time while he was in college to make ends meet and make money for the next, next semester's tuition. Um, scholarships were also offered and the school offered free tuition for the daughters of any and all clergy. You can see some of the costs here. Um, for a 12 week period, students 12 and under $40 not a bad deal. Um, and a lot of things were extra. Um, some girls came just for art or music. And uh, this picture is from about uh, 1855 or so. Um, this was not a genteel finishing school. This was a really robust curriculum and part of it was athletics. The girls were required to put their gym uniforms on and really break a sweat. Uh, I just, I absolutely love this picture. Um, I really would challenge anybody to attempt, say, CrossFit, um, wearing high button boots, knee length skirts over full bloomers, and corsets. Yes, 
these girls were, were wearing corsets. Um, and what's really nice is the young lady on the left in that beautiful gym uniform, that's Laura um, Richardson. Uh, she's the daughter of Amos and, and uh, Ruth. And the young lady on the far right is Annie Seabrook. And we'll get to her in a little while. But see those dumbbells she's holding? Okay, those are the dumbbells that we have in our collection. On the right, those are the exact same ones. Um, this was a well-rounded, active education. And the goal of the Richardsons for these girls was to produce happy, healthy girls who would go on to really contribute to the world in whatever way they could. A little bit about some statistics. Students came from far and wide. They represented 19 states, a lot of New England and Mid-Atlantic, a number from the Southern states, Alabama, Kentucky, Virginia, Tennessee, and Louisiana. The Midwest was represented by girls from Iowa, Illinois, Ohio, and Missouri. 13 of New Jersey's 21 counties were represented and more than 30 towns and hamlets in Monmouth County itself. There was even a girl in 1895 from Samoa. Many girls attended seminary from the primary grades, like age six, right on up to 18 to graduating. And a lot of the seminary graduates went on to higher education at places like Vassar, Baltimore Women's College, Smith College, uh, Coate, and the New York College of Music, to name just a few. Um, some girls didn't graduate, they just came for one or two years to kind of round out their, um, their education after attending the local public school or day school. And then other girls, as I mentioned before, they would sign up just for the music or art classes. The Richardsons really took time to make sure that the girls were happy, challenged, and well occupied. Um, idle hands to the devil's workshop. And um, the Richardsons made sure that the girls were not idle too often. Uh, the Historical Association is really blessed with just the, the deepest type of collections. Um, no matter what you want to learn about the girls at the seminary, we have things to, to tell what was going on at that time. Um, some of my favorite things are the autograph books. Um, some of you may know what they are. Uh, they were small books that uh, the girls would trade back and forth and you would sign uh, you know, a beautiful saying or a little drawing or something like that. And it's really a beautiful way to see all of those, the friendships that were made and the friendships that endured through the years. It's really quite beautiful. Um, and the Richardsons had all kinds of lecturers come in, um, special events, dances. Um, the girls uh, mixed with um, the, uh, the Brother School, which was the Freehold Institute. That's a whole nother lecture. Um, but they, they had dances together and things like that. They signed each other's autograph books. And uh, a number of girls from the seminary actually ended up marrying Institute boys. Um, and they also arranged outings to the shore, Long Branch, uh, Ocean Grove, and uh, farther afield to New York City and even Philadelphia for the centennial. So what were some of these instructors? The, the Richardsons also inspired teachers. And let's take a look at some of those. First off is Emily Coe. She taught the little girls, the primary and preparatory classes. Um, she started in the 1850s at the seminary. She was born in Ohio and she graduated from Mount Holyoke. And after that, she seems to have kind of had an itinerant teaching career. She, she moved all around. She, you, you get the sense that she really didn't, she couldn't settle. And then she came to the seminary. And I think the, the Richardsons helped her focus on what she really wanted to accomplish because after she left the seminary, there was no stopping her. She went to Germany and trained uh, with the um, uh, German teachers learning the German kindergarten method. And when she got back to America, she started training teachers in the American kindergarten method that she developed. She's actually considered the founder of the American kindergarten movement. Um, at her own expense, in 1876, she was able to persuade the committee for the Centennial Exhibition to um, let her build a cottage on the, on the grounds of the, uh, the exhibition, and that's the building on the far right, where she, if you were a visitor to the Centennial, you could actually stop by and see a, uh, an exhibition kindergarten class being taught. Um, and it's kind of fun because that was one of the trips that Amos and Ruth 
arranged for their students and they all went to Philadelphia and I'm sure they stopped by and said hi to Miss Co. She actually appeared at the turn of the century in an article uh, entitled Famous Old Maids and she was uh, on the list uh, with people like Clara Barton. So no one knows who she is now, but at the turn of the century, she was, she was really quite famous. Uh, next up, we have Sally Stark Crocker, and um, she was also a New England girl. She was born in Maine, um, also graduated from Mount Holyoke. And by 1881, she was already recognized as a, uh, a really up and coming portrait painter. 1883, she traveled to Paris, France, and uh, studied at the Académie Julienne and won prizes for her artwork. And uh, the picture on the left is a self-portrait of her that she did, um, just absolutely breathtaking. And um, so she taught at the, uh, the seminary, uh, she taught the art classes uh, after she got back from France. And I think that must have been just so amazing for the seminary girls to have this you know, really wonderful, glamorous art art teacher, you know, who had studied in France and really bringing all of the, you know, the new things that were happening in the art world um, to these girls in Freehold. Um, she had a studio afterwards in New York City um, and ended up in Lakewood um, and where she died in 1941. One of my favorite teachers is uh, Lydia Fowler Wadley. Uh, she taught, um, she came to the seminary in 1853 and taught Latin and mathematics. And um, after she moved to New York, she began teaching at the first public high school specifically for girls, which would eventually transform into Hunter College. Um, near the end of her career, uh, she was the highest single paid educator, male or female, in the state of New York. And her salary, a grand total of $2,400. But it was so amazing that the article um, that you see at the lower left appeared in virtually every newspaper coast to coast. That's how famous she was. One of my favorites is Julia Knapp. Um, she began her career at the seminary in 1859. Uh, yeah, 1859. Um, she taught all the art classes and she's probably the teacher who was at the seminary the longest. She was there more than uh, 20 years and um, hundreds of students uh, remembered her classes fondly. And when she retired in 1879, uh, many, many students got together and she was presented with a deluxe multi-volume set of John Ruskin's modern painters and a set of mantle vases for her. Um, when she died in 1888, uh, the obituaries in the local papers described her as being well and kindly remembered for her many excellent qualities of mind and heart. The Richardson family itself, as I said, Ruth uh, Freeman Richardson, it was like one-stop shopping. Um, a lot of the a lot of the uh, instructor list in, con contain at least one Freeman as a teacher. All three of Ruth's sisters taught there. Um, Charles Freeman Richardson uh, he was educated at the institute, uh, then went on to Princeton College, where he graduated in 1865, and he taught at both the seminary and the institute. Uh, after Amos's death in 1882, he served as temporary principal. And after things were settled at the seminary, he went to Philadelphia where he was the principal instructor at the Pennsylvania Institute for the Blind. Uh, Laura Richardson, Amos and Ruth's daughter, grew up in the seminary. And uh, once she graduated, she then returned as a teacher for many years and she taught music and music appreciation. Of course, one of the major events in this country starting in 1861 was the Civil War, and it had a great impact on schools everywhere. Uh, and the Freehold Young Ladies Seminary was no different. Um, a number of the girls who had come from the South, they went back and the same pre-war numbers never recovered. Uh, after the Civil War, you got maybe one or two girls, a couple girls from Washington, D.C., one or two girls through the years from Virginia but nothing like the pre-war numbers. And the same held true for the Freehold Institute. Um, an article appeared in uh, the Monmouth Democrat in January of 1861, basically complaining about the agitators, the uh, anti-slavery agitators for stirring up trouble and making it uncomfortable 
for the sons and daughters of the Southern families um, and the fact that a, a lot of local businesses would be hurting economically because the money wasn't there. All right. So, um, Amos died uh, in 1881 and the school trustees knew that they would be hard pressed to find somebody equal, but they did. Uh, they located a woman named Eunice Day Sewell, and she and her sister Ada came and took over the running of the seminary. And they kind of changed it a little bit, but that the whole concept of this really robust education, really fitting girls for whatever they wanted to do, still held true. And um, they were there from uh, about 1882, 1883 to their retirement in 1897. And Eunice is on the left there. And she's also in the group picture. You can see her standing sort of on the left um, by the, uh, the, the post. Um, okay. After they retired, um, things really changed. Um, the, uh, the school trustees were hard put to keep it going. So much had changed, uh, not the least of which is that the school had not really expanded. Um, it was really tough to keep things going. Um, a lot of families were not sending their daughters to schools like the seminary anymore. Um, they did for a time keep it going through the office of, the, uh, office of uh, Charles Henry Wright Stocking. He was a reverend. He was a really restless spirit. Um, he, he tried to keep it going, uh, but his heart really wasn't in it. And um, he left within a year and the doors closed permanently. Eventually the buildings would become the Freehold Military School and then eventually be torn down in the 1920s. So what about the students? Um, as I said before, there were more than 900 of them. We're not gonna get to each and every one of them tonight, fortunately, um, but we are gonna hit some high spots. And the first is Maud Allen Horner. Um, she was born in Freehold. She graduated from the seminary in 1892. She studied law in Asbury Park in the offices of Tenbrook and Wesley Stout. Her grandfather, Reverend Chambers, was actually the principal of the Freehold Institute, the seminary's brother school. She never practiced law and New Jersey did not allow females to study law until 1895. So that gap after her graduation and before women were allowed to practice law, she may have decided to kind of cut her losses and move on with her, her career. Um, she would be what we would consider today a paralegal. Uh, she was a, a highly thought of legal secretary uh, and worked for, for many well-known judges in New Jersey. Uh, she also was really quite good at wordplay and uh, was publicized in the newspapers uh, at least twice uh, for winning limerick contests. Carrie Swift, many of you will, you will uh, be familiar with these works. Um, Carrie is really interesting. She was born in Freehold. She went to the seminary. As far as I can tell, she actually never graduated. She might have been one of those girls who went just to sort of round out her education. She trained under Julia Knapp. Uh, she married a man named Thomas Swift in 1869, and he died seven years later. She never had children, and she moved back to the family home on Court Street. I can actually see her house anytime I go out the front door of the museum's building. And um, she just, she really was not interested publicly in politics or, as far as I can tell, the suffrage movement, but she lived her life exactly how she wanted to, and she wanted to live it as an artist. Uh, and so that's what she did. That was her career. And she was well recognized and respected for it. People in Freehold were just so proud of her and her works. And she basically painted scenes of the American Revolution on anything that would stand still long enough, including seashells. Um, and a number of times uh, it was reported in the newspaper that she was working on another large order for stores in Ocean Grove um, that they were, they were selling for the uh, summer tourists. Another woman who graduated from the seminary was Annie Crater. 
She was born in Freehold in 1879. She graduated in 1896. And uh, she went to Vassar. Uh, after graduating there, she married Thomas Haight in 1905. And she was no stranger to politics and public life. Her father, uh, Daniel Crater, was a Monmouth County surrogate judge for more than three decades. And she leaped right into the suffrage cause. In 1914, she was one of the representatives uh, of the New Jersey Women's Suffrage Organization. She attended the 1916 Democratic State Convention. She helped organize parades uh, in New York City for the suffrage movement. Uh, and at her death in 1968, at the age of 90, her obituary really goes through her career. And um, we also learned that she was an associate of Margaret Sanger, and she helped found the Bergen County Planned Parenthood Association and its first clinic. Uh, Axa Mount Eli, uh, I call her the mathematician. Um, she was born in Manalapan, local girl, uh, 1845. Aksa is actually, people always ask me this, what does that name mean? And it's actually Old Testament meaning adorned. She graduated in 1857 and then went to Vassar and she was part of the first graduating class. She taught in Connecticut. Um, for a time she was principal at the Petty Institute. And then she went to New York City to teach for a time. And in 1887, she returned to Vassar and headed up the mathematics department until 1904. Uh, she never stopped learning, always stayed curious where math was concerned. Um, she continued her own studies, and she was a member of the American Mathematical Society, and she was one of only seven women to attend the Second International Congress of Mathematicians in Paris out of 250 people. I, I can just imagine what it must have been like being one of only seven women to walk into that space with 250 uh, Victorian male mathematicians. That must have been quite something. She loved Vassar and worked tirelessly on the um, Alumni Foundation. Um, and when she died suddenly in 1904, the tributes were just amazing. One of them said she was uh, someone who united rare qualities as a woman and as an instructor. And another said that in her teaching and personal influence, she was a power on the side of a truly liberal education and the widest opportunities for women. My traveling sisters, Eleanor and Marion. Uh, now the picture in, on the uh, top left is not actually a picture of, uh, of the Laird sisters, but this is the model car that they would have driven around in. Uh, they were both born in Freehold and lived their lives in the family home on East Main Street, and they were within walking distance of the seminary. They were day students. They graduated in the early 1890s, and they were very active in local society. Um, their father's success in the Laird family's Applejack company uh, allowed them funds to travel, and travel they did. Neither of them married, uh, but they would hop into their car. They were very early automobile enthusiasts. They would drive to Vermont and Provincetown. And, you know, I'm just going to remind everybody this is well before GPS and the United States highway system. So this was quite adventurous in those days. And they also traveled much farther afield to Italy, France, Bermuda, California, all over the place. Um, but Marion was a practical career woman. Uh, she taught in the Newark school system for many years, and she was the first woman bank director in the county. She was elected one of the directors of the First National Bank of Freehold in 1922. Uh, and in 1903, Marion was also instrumental in getting Freehold its Carnegie Library. She literally wrote personally to Andrew Carnegie asking him for money, and he sent her $10,000. Um, and so that's the building that still stands, a beautiful, beautiful building, still stands today on Main Street in Freehold. And she and her sister actually helped lay the cornerstone, and there were newspaper articles that actually hinted that they actually put a bottle of the family Applejack in the cornerstone itself. So I don't know if that's true or not, but that's kind of interesting. Um, and during the First World War, they ran a huge bandage collection and rolling band bandage rolling station out of their home. Then we have the Yard sisters. Their dad, James Sterling Yard, ran the Monmouth Democrat. And um, interestingly enough, that's where I get most of the information from because you couldn't have a, an issue of the Monmouth Democrat with without at least one or two big articles regarding the, uh, the seminary. 
all three of James's daughters went to the seminary. Um, this is Emma. Uh, Emma attended the seminary. She married a man named William Ivins, a lawyer and politician. And about 1900 or so, she read an article by Susan B. Anthony uh, in the New York Sun about the suffrage movement. And it just seemed to sort of light a spark in her. And she sent uh, Anthony a check for $50 and a letter in which she wrote that for a long time, I've had a great desire to enroll myself on the side of the suffragists and enrolled herself she did. She and Anthony became close friends uh, when Susan B. Anthony was in the New York City area uh, where Emma and her husband had their home. She would stay with the, with the Ivanses. Uh, she was very close personal friends with Emma. Um, she served as a treasurer and member of the New York State Women's Suffrage Association. She was a delegate to the International Congress of Women and she visited London many times and met with people like Emma and Christabel Pankhurst she actually scolded them. She scolded the Pankhursts about their violent methods because she felt it detracted from the overall suffrage movement. And Emma was a, a toastmistress at the Jubilee ceremony. And in her opening remarks, she said, it is women and not men who have been the real civilizers and that civilization is only the history of the influence of women on the world. Um, she was also voted, oddly enough, uh, the most popular suffragist at the 1911 New York State Women's Bazaar, but I have a feeling it was actually sort of a sarcastic newspaper report because the year previous there had been quite a kerfuffle over the um, suffrage booth at the Women's Bazaar and they actually shut it down for a time and um, Emma actually consulted a lawyer and, and had them reopen it. Um, her sister, Adeline, uh, she was born apparently with printer's ink in her veins and her father, James, would make her, even as a little girl, um, when she went to a different, you know, an event or an occasion or something like that, when she got home, she had to write a story about it and then he would edit it. Um, and that, that held true for almost anything that happened with her. Um, in 1893, she visited the Chicago World's Fair um, and wrote an article about that. In fact, probably quite a few articles that appeared in the Monmouth Democrat were written by her. Um, and on September 21st, 1893, her name appeared on the newspaper's banner for the very first time as assistant editor to her father. Um, so that was quite a coup for a young woman her age. And for at least a year in 1898, she was the only one running the newspaper. Her father was ill and her brother Joseph was actually off fighting in the Spanish-American War. Uh, and a rival newspaper in Red Bank, the Red Bank Daily Register actually noticed the change and commented on it that it was, they noticed the change and it was a big improvement. Um, she was a little, uh, she married a little later in life. She married at the age of 31 to Judge Ruliff Lawrence. Uh, and he was an institute boy. So here's an, uh, an example of a seminary girl marrying an institute boy. Um, and she was active not only as a reporter, but as a wife, a mother, and the women's movement. In 1926, she was the first woman to run for the New Jersey State Senate. And part of her campaign platform was the repeal of prohibition. She didn't win, um, but she had made great strides in uh, state politics as a woman. And next up, we have Annie Seabrook Conover. Uh, she was born in Westchester County in 1852. I feel a slight connection because I myself was born in Westchester County. Um, later on, her family moved to Keyport and her father, Henry Seabrook, was the principal manager of the Middletown Point Steamboat Company, as well as the town's postmaster. And one of the reasons we have such a beautiful glimpse into the lives of the seminary girls is because of Annie. She saved virtually every scrap of paper, every bill, every report card. I even know what her grades were. She was a very good student, by the way. Um, photographs, you name it. Um, and she also had deep roots uh, on both her mother's and her father's side. Um, on her mother's side, uh, she had long streets and we actually have a sampler you can see on the left um, from one of her ancestors in our collection. And the picture in the center, uh, that's Laura Richardson on the left, and there is uh, Annie Seabrook on the right. Um, and they were the two girls in the, uh, the gymnastics uh, photograph that we saw a little earlier. And the picture on the far right 
is Annie um, as an elderly lady on the left, and that's her daughter, Vera Conover. Um, Annie was one of these women who, again, had more energy than any three people. Um, beginning with seminary, she founded the uh, uh, Friends Society. Um, after she married William Conover, she became very active in Keyport Society. Uh, she played the organ at the Baptist Church. She was a member of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. She organized the Keyport Lyceum. Um, and she taught her children, particularly her daughter Vera, a love of history and preservation. Um, and the Seabrook women were so pivotal in Keyport history that in 1979, Elsa Lynn Drucker, who, by the way, was the librarian many years ago at the association, um, received a grant to produce a history of the Seabrook women, Annie, her mother, Teresa Walling Seabrook, and her daughter, Vera Conover. Um, Annie died in 1943 at the age of 91. On Tuesday, June 11th, 1895, Seminary celebrated its 50 years in existence with a huge party, ceremony, and luncheon. Over 200 former seminary students attended, along with current students, uh, family members, and a very special honored guest. Ruth Freeman Richardson came to the celebration, and that's Ruth in the center picture. Of the first six graduates of the seminary, three were there. Uh, current students under the direction of senior Elizabeth Foreman transformed Seminary Hall into, as the Monmouth Democrat described it, a perfect floral bower. After a luncheon of oysters, lobster croquettes, strawberries, and sandwiches, uh, the ladies listened to toasts and tributes. Mrs. Richardson read from her reminiscences, particularly about the mud. Maud Horner recited her poem, The New Woman. And Gertrude Applegate Maxwell, one of the speakers, mentioned that when she graduated in 1859, it wasn't the custom for the girls to read their own essays at the ceremony. Instead, prominent men of the town read them. She had come back 36 years later, she said, to speak for herself. And one of the last comments, uh, the poem was a poem read by Harriet Walters Chadburn, who had graduated the seminary in 1853, uh, including stanzas which celebrated women's achievements and the frustration that they didn't have the right to vote yet. Women, uh, woman is emancipated, so we often hear it stated, and from her old-fashioned thraldom she is evermore set free. While in any chosen mission she may follow her ambition, help reform the world and make it what it really ought to be. But there is a charmed center where she may not freely enter. Even in the song of triumph, there is still a minor note. And in spite of all successes, there is one thing which distresses, or except in favored places, she is not allowed. Thank you. I will take questions now from Dana. Bernadette, that was wonderful. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Oh my God, that was amazing. You know, I just want to tell you from seeing all of the old photographs from the 1800s, the streets of Freehold, I picture it that way. You know, I picture the dirt streets, but I never really pictured people. And now I kind of have a cast of characters to, to fill that. That's really great. Okay. So um, hold on one second. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. We're going to go here. Before um, we move on to the Q&A tonight, I just want to remind everyone about our upcoming lecture with MCHA Associate Curator Joe Zella. Beneath the floorboards is a presentation on the fascinating new findings in the quarters of the enslaved at Merle Pitt Hall. And we're very excited about this one because it's not every day that discoveries like this are made. And Joe's done some really fantastic research. I think everybody's gonna enjoy, right, Bernadette? It's amazing. Oh, ab absolutely, his, his research is just, groundbreaking um you, you will you will really regret it if you if you miss it it's going to yeah. be spectacular so don't forget to register for april 15th and hopefully it'll take your mind off your taxes <laughs> right um okay so we'll move on to the q a and we have a couple of questions um so glenn was asking how and where did the seminary market itself i know we saw it a lot like in the Monmouth democrat newspaper advertisements did it advertise anywhere else Oh yes, tons of places. Um, Glenn, they, they, uh, Amos 
uh, advertised in um, papers throughout New England and the mid-Atlantic states and even in some southern newspapers, Tennessee, um, Alabama, all over the place. Um, and they apparently did mass mailings of their catalogs. They sent them to lots of different places as well as newspapers. And the newspapers would report that they had gotten these beautiful catalogs from the Freehold Seminary and that parents should definitely send their daughters there. So they really did market themselves very well. And um, the Sewell sisters continued that, uh, put their the advertisements in lots of different newspapers. Um, do we own the Sally Crocker self-portrait? Is that from our collection? I wish, wouldn't that be nice? No, we do not. No, we do not. Um, Nancy would like to know if the program was consistent or could the teachers, uh, was it like a set curriculum or could the teachers sort of, uh, were they a little bit flexible with what they could teach and were there finals that? Um... Yes, they, they definitely had finals and um, the finals were actually from time to time reported. Um, they didn't quite go far enough in reporting, you know, the actual grades, fortunately. Um, so if you didn't do well in your test, you weren't publicly embarrassed. Um, the curriculum was very broad, um, and I don't know, certainly if, if, I don't think any of us could, could pass some of the, um, the, the really rigorous educational demands that this school offered. As I said before, this was not a finishing school. Um, Mrs. Richardson made sure the girls uh, knew their manners. Um, they were taught, you know, decorum and, and politeness and so on. Um, but this was a demanding curriculum. Um, they were not taught needlework or anything. That's kind of how serious it was. Um, I have heard questions, you know, oh, did they learn, you know, samplers or needlework or something? No, they did not. That was not part of the curriculum at all. Um, because uh, Amos Richardson wanted to be really uh, very rigorous. Were there other comparable schools in Monmouth County? Um, not to the extent that the seminary was. Um, there were local schools. There was a girls' school at Middletown Point. Um, there were some out in Western Monmouth. Um, and then you had schools in New York. You had schools in Philadelphia. But the seminary really was kind of um, a real focal point um, in the mid-Atlantic states. Um, somebody's asking why it was called a seminary. Um, it was a, not an uncommon term to call a school a seminary because a seminary meant a place of education, a place of coming together to learning. Um, so that's that's basically what it was reflecting. And most of the things that you showed tonight, those are from our collection, right? Yes, they are. That That's one of the things that in one way kind of makes it really easy to research. We have uh, virtually every catalog, including the original 1845 Firts Prospectus. We have photographs, we have autograph books, we have um, school books. That's one thing I love about all these seminary girls. They saved everything. That's one of the things that makes me think that this was really quite a special place because it wasn't just one or two girls saving stuff. We have we have things from the seminary from dozens and dozens and dozens of former seminary students. So that tells me that this was something special that they really wanted to remember. Um, somebody is asking, hold on, it's hard to, it's scrolling so quickly. <laughs> was it so a many questions. <laughs> was it a school for rich kids? Um, Sometimes it depended, it depended. Um, you did have wealthy individuals sending their daughters here, um, but you had a lot of local people, a lot of local farmers, um, you know, who were doing well, but would not have been considered wealthy or upper class. Um, it was solid middle class. Um, they did offer extensive scholarships, as I mentioned before, uh, and they did advertise that in the newspapers. Uh, you could write to Mr. Richardson to discuss it with him, and there were a number of girls who were going there on full scholarships. Um, and as I said, they also offered completely free tuition to any daughters of clergy anywhere in the country. You said about 900 girls graduated? Uh, 900 girls attended. Attended? Um, yeah, attended. More than 900. Um, I'm not quite sure just yet, I'm still doing statistical analysis, so I'm not quite sure how many graduated, um, but as I said, there were more than 900 girls, because again, you could go for one year, two years, you could, you could go just for art, you could go just for music, it depended on what you wanted. 
Okay. How many were there at one time? Do you know? Uh, you know, like, uh, that depended on on every any given year. There might have been anywhere from thirty to forty boarding girls. Uh, girls were staying there as boarders, and then an additional eighty to one hundred and ten day students. And in addition to that, there might be twenty to thirty girls who were doing just the music and or art segments of the curriculum. There were quite a lot, quite a lot of girls. This, uh, I'm picturing it on South Street, but it, was it South Street or Main Street? It went from South Street to Main Street. The original building faced up against Main Street, and then the new building uh, in which Amos Richardson has had his tragic construction accident um, faced uh, Broad Street. So it went from one block all the way. So quite a bit across the property. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Were the teachers well paid? I don't, I actually don't know. Um, I have not come across any documentation specifically that tells me what the teachers were paid. Um, because they were able to attract such a high quality of teacher, um, and many of the teachers uh, stayed quite a long time, maybe not as long as Julia Knapp did for 20 years, but a number of the teachers stayed five, eight, 10, 15 years. Um, so that tells me that they were, they were able to make a living certainly and, um, and do, do well uh, doing so. Okay, somebody's asking how they heated the buildings and she wants to know if they held their feet over live coals. And I know what you're gonna say. I know who that one is, that's my sister. Um, actually, the, um, the school boasted um, fireplaces and it was uh, one of the early buildings in Freehold to uh, have gas, uh, gas lighting and so on. Um, it was very comfortable. Um, and some of the, the catalogs, it's fun to see a list of the things that the students were supposed to bring. Um, and these were not coddled girls. They were supposed to bring raincoats and rain boots and umbrellas and so on because they were expected to go outside and get fresh air uh, every day that they possibly could. Kevin would like to know if it's connected at all to the Presbyterian Church that was once next door? Um, not, not specifically. A number of the trustees through the years were connected with the Presbyterian Church or were um, uh, reverends there, ministers. Um, a lot of the girls attended the Presbyterian Church. Uh, Amos and Ruth were Presbyterians themselves. Um, so a lot of the girls in the seminary uh, went to the Presbyterian Church and uh, were also very involved with, um, you know, the auxiliary and um, a lot of the events and, uh, and special occasions there. Okay. Um, did the girls do chores? Did they upkeep the, their environment or did they have like a house cleaning? They were, it, they were expected to keep the, the, well, the boarders, for example, there were two, two girls to a room and they were expected to keep their rooms neat and tidy. Um, they weren't expected to do heavy chores, you know, like hauling coal or, or things like that. Um, but they were expected to keep their book neat and tidy. Um, they were expected to keep their clothes clean. They didn't have to do the laundry themselves. Um, pardon me, but they, um, uh, you know, they had to keep their, their rooms tidy, the classrooms neat and clean, um, but they didn't have to do any of the domestic chores, no. Okay. Somebody's asking what's there now. I, I guess it's that pharmacy there on the corner, right? Um, let's see. I <laughs> used think, to be the hotel. I think on Broad Street, um, that's going to be where the, it used to be the Broad Street School. Uh, okay. um, that's roughly where I think, um, the, the new building that was built in 1855, that's roundabout where it stood. And so then if you go from Broad Street up front, see what's there, the municipal building. So that's the, that's the footprint of the property. Okay. So many questions are coming in. And guys, I like that. I don't, that means everybody's engaged. It was, at least some people were paying attention. So that's good. Oh, Kevin just said Bank of New York is there. Okay. Ah, okay. So that's, that's the property. Okay. Yeah, if we don't get to your questions, you can um, email them to dhowell at monmouthhistory.org or actually you can go directly to Bernadette, which would be B. Rogoff you at monmouthhistory.org. Yeah, and she can answer some of your questions. I'll answer them. Um, yeah. Let's see. One thing I will note, I don't know if anybody asked, but one thing that I thought was very interesting was that in all the years, and I literally read every issue, 
of the Monmouth Democrat. Um, there was literally never a hint of scandal, um, any kind of, of problems or issues. Um, with the Freehold Institute, you got a bunch of boys. Um, there, were, there were some uh, instances, including, believe it or not, a school shooting. Yes, in the 19th century, there was, there was a school shooting. Um, and a barn burned down and a couple other things. So you kind of wonder what was going on over there. Um, but the Freehold Ladies Seminary, not a hint of scandal. Somebody is asking, this is a good question, um, what was the reason for the decrease in registration that sort of led to the school closing? Um, changing society and um, the real push uh, for public school education. Um, so as public school education became uh, more accessible, um, uh, more formalized, uh, you had less and less need for uh, schools like the seminary. And I think that coupled with the aging campus really spelled its downfall. Um, it was, the buildings were just so old. And uh, after you reach a certain point, you really have to be able to expand the campus. And there really was no elbow room to expand. Um, and a lot of the original trustees who had seen it through its, its first, um, first years with the Richardsons and then with the Sewells had aged and gotten older, moved away or passed away. So you didn't have that same really passionate support that you did in the first decades. Were all of the teachers women? No, they had uh, male and female teachers. Uh, and interestingly enough, the teachers kind of did double duty. Um, not only, for example, was Amos Richardson the principal and one of the instructors at the seminary, but he also taught classes in philosophy and a couple other uh, uh, subjects at the institute and vice versa. Um, so one of the French teachers, for example, a male French teacher at the institute was teaching French at the seminary. So you would see them swapping instructors back and forth. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, we have somebody here, the great grand niece of someone who graduated from the seminary in 1869. So that's pretty Ooh. cool. Which, uh, which, uh, which name? Anne Van Huys. Really? Oh, mm -hmm. wow. Was that the name of the graduate? Uh, I, uh, Louisa Myers graduated from the seminary in 18. She is on my list. Yes. Awesome. I have, com I am compiling, I've, I've, um, I have a running list. Uh, a spreadsheet of all the uh, the students. Oh, that's great! Because that was another question. Do we have a list? <laughs> oh, we sure we sh I sure do. Oh yes, <laughs> yeah. And uh, I'm I keep biographies on all the girls mm -hmm. um, because there there are 900 of them to uh, to research. So I haven't gotten to every single one of them yet. And there are no books on this topic, correct, Bernadette? No, there are not. But there will be at some point. I'm about literally. I'm about halfway through a manuscript writing mm -hmm. about it because it's just such a great story. Yeah, so, it really is. Yeah. So hopefully okay, in another year I'll have it done. So mm -hmm. then we get to find a publisher and we'll see what happens. All right. Thank you so much, Bernadette. This was awesome. My pleasure. Thank you, Dana. You made it so easy and so much fun. <laughs>